Okay, we got the final session of track three today. We're with Zachary Chechevat, and I'm specifically excited for this one because uh, Zachary is an experienced data analytics engineer at Ritual, and he just has a really deep knowledge of SQL, DBT, and the whole data stack, whether it's open source or closed source. So I'm really excited to hear from that. I hope you guys are too. And um, again, for anybody that's coming in new, you got the chat room on the right of your screen. You can QA anything to Zachary, and the chat is for whatever other blabber we're doing. So, Zachary, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks, Parker. Um, yeah, so I'm Zachary Chetrabat. I work at Ritual, which is a direct-to-consumer supplements company. Um, it's one of the core values there is uh, traceability, and our product is kind of this very beautiful looking multivitamin as well as some other stuff. Um, I've worked here for about eight to nine months, and I've been, I've been working in data for about, let's say like 10 years since I graduated. Um, so today's talk is gonna be about understanding um, three ways to solve a common problem across subscription businesses. Um, and the key thing about this is that this is about uh, subscription businesses. Um, we want you know a business that has like a dedicated beginning and end for uh, for like a customer, so that we can kind of track these subscription periods, which is the important concept here. Um, and so the idea is that you are you know a data analyst, data analytics engineer, data engineer at a subscription business. And your business has questions. And those questions are, how many active subscribers did we have three months ago? How many of them made it to the end of that month? What's our churn rate? How many active subscribers do we have per week? What's our monthly recurring revenue? How many, company, how many customers make it to month two, to month three, um, and et cetera? And you know, these are like very common questions to have across a lot of businesses. And, uh, but I think something that is also common across these businesses from kind of the engineering side is that you have a subscriptions table, a customer table, and it acts like this. Uh, it reflects what's going on right now with a subscription. When someone cancels, it, it just appends a cancel date. And when they uncancel, it nulls out the cancel date. Um, I've been at a couple of companies. Uh, I used to work at ShipStation, which had this problem. We merged with two other companies, Shipworks and Shipping Easy, and they also had this problem. And right now I work at Ritual, which also has this problem. So based on my N of two, maybe four if you're generous, like this is to me a common problem. And like why this kind of is weird is you, when you answer these questions, like how many active customers did I have? Um, week over week. Your answer could change depending on when you give it. Uh, and it's just because the data is not like idempotent, which is the word of the day. Um, and like, why isn't it the same as last time? Like, this is what's going on uh, as you answer these questions. And like, this is gonna happen a lot. Churn is an industry standard um, without like a good definition. And then this kind of plays into MRR, which is something that a lot of companies will care about. Um, but at, at its core, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to write this query, you know, give me the week, the count of subscribers, where they're active. Um, and you want the table to look like this, like this is your ideal kind of table here. You got your calendar date, your subscription ID, and just like active and canceled. But this is in your way, because if I query this, at one point in time, it'll it'll show up as active. Another time, it shows up as canceled. And what you want to solve this is you want to somehow get to this table where it's a subscription ID that has the start of the subscription, the end of the subscription, and then the start of the next one and the end of the next one. And so there are a couple ways you can handle this. Um, the first way I'm going to talk about it's kind of like using really common like modern data stack tooling stuff that's like vendor heavy but like light on code that isn't SQL. Um, and so kind of the assumptions here are that you're you're mostly going to be writing SQL to do this. You're going to be using um, 
Airbyte or Fivetran or something to get data out of another software and that your company uses like a billing provider. So it'd be like a Stripe or a Recurly, something, uh, a company that handles the billing and invoicing part for you. And then it would be nice if you had DBT or like a DBT-like internally so you can, you know, save this logic, but it's not necessary as long as the other parts are there. Um, and in theory, you know, that data flow is just going to look like this. You have your production database that goes to your warehouse, and now you have a billing provider that goes into your warehouse. Um, and if you're lucky, you could get it for free, right, where the, the data, the billing provider itself has its own has its own subscription periods table. And then, you know, using that, you can just kind of clean it up a little bit. Um, but let's kind of like go into each of these parts. Like this is the free part. You got your subscription ID. It starts at a date. It ends at a date. It expires at a date. These could mean separate things. You know, what, what you really want to like zone in on kind of depends on what the people in the business care about. Um, this part requires you to like know how to write some like semi-advanced SQL. Um, and really like the confusing thing is like, what am I doing here? I'm, I'm trying to get like the last subscription event and either um, give me the cancel date um, or if it's not there, then, they just, and then just give me um, this future date. And then if it is, if it is there, uh, just give me the cancel date or the next start date. And so this gives you like a cleanish like subscription periods table. Um, and that is kind of like what this does. Um, and so like why I started this talk was because I saw this tweet on Twitter about Brittany Bennett, who works in progressive politics. She currently is the national data director of the Working Families Party. And she has this question, right? Like, I want to get subscribers per week. And her context is like way different than my context, but it's still the same question. How many active subscribers do we have per week? If you look at this tweet and you kind of look at the responses, you'll see that there are a lot of solutions there that like devoid of context probably work. And it's kind of like up to each of your individual contexts to figure out which solution works best for you. Um, and so like in her case, she has data that kind of looks like this, right? You have subscriptions and then you just have like a transactional event table. And so from this, uh, you can write this. This is kind of the query that her team wrote to answer this question. Um, you take you, you take the subscription ID and then that start date and you just get the next event uh, using a window function. Uh, which, and then from there, you just get the pairs, you restrict your data set to the sequences that you want. And then, um, and then from that, you can join to a date spine and that will get you your subscription periods table. Um, and all of that is kind of hard to explain to like not someone who does this every day. The like doing this style, you it's all in SQL. Um, the tools for this are really common. You may already have them. And the logic is kind of self-contained in your transformation tool. You pull it in, it's all there. Um, the cons of this are like, the SQL is complex. You move your source of truth outside of your application, um, which could lead to like some conflict if not everyone is on the same page. It, require, it requires trust in your, your billing provider data. And then if you change billing providers, you're going to have to do some gymnastics there to accommodate the new one while keeping the old data. And then if you don't have some of these tools, you're, you might have to convince your company to buy them. And that could be like price restrictive. Um, another way to do this is to use snapshots, right? And so I'm going to talk about DBT snapshots. No, I've tricked you. I'm not. You're wrong. I'm going to talk about just like taking a snapshot. Like you can use you can use DBT for this. You can use you can write your own code to do this. This requires you to have kind of super user on your data warehouse, and it would be nice if you had uh, cloud storage to do this. Um, and the idea behind this is like, why worry about a data source other than your own? Like we want to trust our data, our 
our product, our application is a source of truth. And instead of getting subscription periods, I can just get this table. Um, and the idea here is that the production database extracts to your data warehouse. You're going to do a snapshot, and that's going to be orchestrated by some software. Could be DBT Cloud, could be Airflow, and then you're going to feed that back into your warehouse. Um, in this example, I use DBT Cloud because it's the most interesting way to do this. Um, Airflow and Daxter, like when you write just straight code, it's pretty straightforward. But the idea broadly is that you want to create a function that unloads your data, um, and you want to, and in theory, you can create like a model that represents the data you want to be unloaded. But you just want something to like unload a table. Um, you want to run it every day. Like how you do it, how you do it depends on what you have in DBT Cloud. You use like run operation, and then you want to reload the unloaded data. You could this could be in Redshift Spectrum or Snowpipe or something. Or if you're like really wild, you can just ins instead of writing an unload function, you can just write an insert function. Um, and in and in theory, right? What you're doing here is you're going to like select star from your customer table for that day, save it, and then put it back in your database. So then you just get the table for then you just get the table. Your the result is your calendar day subscription table. If you want to, you can capture extra data along with your core subscription data. So like for us at Ritual, that would be like a customer, a subscription can have a couple of items and we can snapshot that subscription and those items in the same query and then clean it up later to have like a subscription level um, retention table. This keeps the application data as a source of truth, which is nice. Everyone's on the same page. We're not confused about differences between billing and state and when that happens. And the data is pretty immutable. Um, some of the cons here are that storage can become an issue depending on how you store it. Um, you know, if you have if you have 100,000 customers and 10 days of that becomes a million rows, right? That can get big quick. Um, depending on how you structure this process, this pipeline could be especially fragile. It's something you want to be you want to keep monitoring. You want to be sure that this is this runs smoothly. And then like a big con here is that the data is immutable. If you want to change your logic, um, you can't retroactively do those changes. You just kind of have to do them going forward. Um, and then the last one is kind of the most sophisticated one using the most cutting edge technology, which is change data capture, um, which is old. Uh, change data capture essentially is uh, when a database is changed, it will track like the insert and update and delete statements. and makes it available to other systems. A common way to do to get this is to use uh, Kafka, where you can just stream it into a topic and then stream it out into a data warehouse or into cold storage or something. Um, this requires, this will again require kind of like all the same tools to work with your data, but you're just adding like this infrastructure debt. Um, if you're going to go this way, I, I hope you have just like an immaculate relationship with your DBA team and your DevOps team, because they're going to be doing most of the heavy lifting on this one. Um, and this is kind of like a high level of what's going on. You do your regular extraction, and then on the street, you can send the CDC stream to your Kafka topic, into cloud storage, and then back into your warehouse. Um, to do this, you're going to need the DBA part is you need to configure your database for CDC. I don't think it comes by default. You have to like apply some settings on like SQL Server or Postgres. You can set up the Kafka cluster to do this, um, or you know you could have your DevOps team do it. It really depends on your team's capabilities. Um, you store the data, uh, you transform it, you kind of write that SQL we wrote a long time ago, and then you can analyze it. Um, and so the pro is that it keeps it as a, your application as a source of truth, which is nice. The data is immutable, but you kind of gain this state as it changes, right? You'll have all the inserts, all the updates, so you can kind of understand more completely what's changing in your data. If your company utilizes like microservice architecture, where like each service kind of has its own database, this is like a nice thing to have where you can say like, here's our like common, anal common interface for analytics. Um, 
some of the cons here is that this requires a lot of cross-functional work to set up or just like some, a couple of people who are really, really smart, much smarter than me. And effectively, this creates like a new product that you have to maintain in your organization. There are like some vendor ways to do this, but those are kind of like on the newer side, on, on the newer side. Um, and then kind of lastly, we want to talk about the trade-offs. And this is the thing that is kind of the point of this is that this these are all solutions to the same problem, right? And like how you want to solve it depends on a lot of constraints that is unique to you. Like who who's getting the most out of this? Is there any demand to do this? Or can you afford to be wrong like every quarter and just kind of wave it away? Um, if you want to do some of the more complicated solutions, like who is going to be involved in this? And will they make time for you? Like, do you have those relationships with the DBA teams, the engineering teams, DevOps teams to stand up infrastructure or to give you access to like the other parts of AWS that you may not have access to? And then like, how does your company consider cost? Are they open to adding new types of spend? Some of these, uh, some of these things I mentioned before, like if you don't have these vendors, do you want to start these relationships? Um, there is like storage and compute uh, potential spend in some of these where you're pulling in these big data sets and you'll have to like compute on them. Um, and just like, as you spin up, if you go the CDC route, that's kind of like its own fully fledged product, right? You'll have to consider how long it has to stay standing. Like, does that budget lay with you? Does it lay with other teams? And these are the things you want to think about as you approach kind of like any solution, right? Like what is the context? What's the demand? And like, how much money is my team willing to spend here? And then technical, right? Like what solution kind of like fits your team the best? Like technically, you know, the streaming one is super interesting and you can do a lot of cool things, but that would take, that would take me like months to do versus like if I just go with some of the more simpler ones that could take me like a week to do. And then kind of like which solution fits your current tooling. Um, and then as you think about your tooling and as it evolves, like how do you want this to fit and like what tooling makes sense for your organizational context? Like if you're all on AWS, like maybe you don't need to use Snowflake. You can just use Redshift and that it like stays in that spend and you can just kind of like mask how much you're spending because engineers spend 10x what your Redshift spend is or something. And then once your team has the data, like, can they actually do the analysis? Like, are they, can they do like survival analysis, churn prediction, churn modeling, time series, like which, or is there like education needed on the types of analyses that can be done? Or is, are we just looking to like answer, like how many customers can we solve week over week? Um, and kind of these are the things you want to consider as you just think about solutions, right? Like you have problems. And you really want to think about the constraints that happen, like the constraints that you have in your context of how to solve this problem. Because sometimes the fancy thing may be really cool, but it's very extra and you just need to get something done now. Um, and that concludes my talk. Yeah, so are there any questions? I do not see any questions yet, but while we're waiting for them to come in, I want to see something. Okay, perfect. Um, so, yeah, the que I have a specific question about, um, you were talking about making sure that you have like the relationships internally to be able to implement these things just because like they can cost a lot or they can take a lot of like your time and your team's time. Um, have you ran into that where like there's something in your organization that it's like, Hey, like, I think we need, you know, this investment in data. And like, they've said no, or like an example of when they said yes, like kind of like how you've navigated that. Yeah. Um, I think a good example is that kind of the CDC solution that I mentioned, um, where I'd written um, like an RFC or like a, a plan, right? Of like, this will be our standard interface for analytics. Um, the company then was 
building like tons of small services, but they all had their own like small databases to store um, what those services did. And, you know, someone somewhere wants to know like, hey, I spent X hours of engineering time to build this rating service. I want to know how it's doing. I want to know who's using it. But either, and then the engineers will spend like some amount of time writing queries on that database. And then eventually they're going to be like, hey, data team, can you help me with this? And it comes up and it's just kind of like letting those like complaints come in and just being like, all right, so I buy in from like this guy and this guy and this guy, which is like these two directors, right? And I know like this infrastructure kind of exists over here so we can leverage some of that. Cause like knowing the full, for me, it was just like, I, I like shook a lot of hands. I like kissed a lot of babies and was like, Hey, I want to build, <laughs> I want to build this, you know, requires like, I'm, I need to use Kafka, you know, we're going to stream it here. I need like DevOps help to like set up the, the roles and the buckets and everything. But that's kind of like, that was my, one of my strategies. Another one was to be like proactive, but I think like without a problem, a concrete problem to solve, it's kind of rough. Um, it's kind of rough yeah, out yeah. there. Yeah. The use case like definitely has to be there, like an immediate reason to use it. Yeah. And then we have a question from uh, Lisa Fang. I haven't spent much time with uh, Recurly or Stripe reporting, but I understand that there is some out of the box functionality there. Have you found these um, to be too general to be useful? Um, yeah. So I think there is a lot of out of the box functionality, but for the purposes of like financial reporting, it's like too separate from the rest of our reporting. So we've always found the need to just like suck it in and, you know, sum those invoices kind of there and have them next to our customer accounts so that, uh, so that someone in finance or accounting can say like, this is what our customer accounts revenue looks like month over month. It is useful for those teams like independently to kind of get like gut checks. But when you want to start kind of bringing everything in and answer like board meeting questions, I guess, right? Like what's your growth, et cetera. You'll, you'll want everything in the same place with the same interface because like you can't like, you can't like query recurly. You might be able to query Stripe. I haven't tried that. Um, but it's just having it in a centralized place makes it easier to answer some of the more like common fire drill questions or like quarterly reporting questions that you're going to get. And then we have one more question from Katie. If you can only pick three tools in your data stack, which ones do you pick? Okay. That one's kind of fun. So it's not like pick three tools of the whole thing. It's like you only have three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you going to go with? I think that's fun. Yeah. I think I, I personally am a super cost sensitive person. So like I'm going to choose five train or something, right. Where it's, if I had to write all those integrations myself, that would take a million dollars. Like it's X number of engineers. Right. So there, that's like a good cost savings. Um, I know everyone, I would pick a warehouse. I don't know, like the warehouse thing. I'm like kind of shaky on it's like, if I'm small enough, I probably, I can just do a Postgres instance and be okay. Um, DBT is like a big time saver for me. I'm not, I'm not good enough at Python to write my own DBT, which is like what a lot of people do kind of like yeah. pre pre DBT is that I think everyone has uh -huh. seen a permutation of it, but I would just, I would just pay for that. I think that's like a huge time saver. Um, and then the last one, I guess we have to include BI. That's this is the hard one. Is like I don't have any good answers for, like which BI tool I would use if I'm like sacrificing the warehouse. Because um, I yeah. think they're 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 all bad in their spe their own special way. <laughs> which the least bad one that would fit in the category? Uh, I think like Looker kind of fits that. I guess if it's the one I, if the looker is like the least bad one if you want to scale self-service. But if I want to have fun, I'm probably going to pick like Hex or something or Deep okay. Note, right? Like those are the fun ones. And with that, those are all the questions that have rolled in. 
And that also concludes the tech track, uh, track number three for the day. We start back up tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So whatever that time is for you, we'd love to have you back. We have a ton of good talks tomorrow. And before we sign off, um, if you, audience, if you go to the left of your screen, you'll see the little hamburger menu. Um, you can go to track one and then enter the lounge. And that's where Donnie Flynn is going to uh, teach us some data disaster stories and kind of things that you can avoid. And then that concludes all sessions for the rest of the day. So Zachary, thanks a ton. We love the session. And uh, if you have any questions for him, check him out in the OA club. See you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye.